So, walk me through just the start of this. I mean, you didn't all of a sudden, hey, I'm gonna be, I'm no, gonna be a powerlifter. No, I, you know, I, I, I started off. I wrestled a little bit in high school. I was 4'11", 98 pounds my first year in high school, so that's was a 98 pound weight class, and I just didn't want to be small anymore. And I started lifting, and uh, I went in a bodybuilding contest in like 1980. The Central USA and guys like Lance Dreer and Tim Belknap, and they were in the open division. I was in the teenage division. I took like, you know, 900th out of, you know, 901. And uh, pale as can be, before they even posed the music, I think I took Franco Colombo's poses out of the back of his book. And I used to go through Arnold's book, and I did, I do all like the chest, if I had chest day, I do all the chest exercises in that day, three hours long, till I couldn't even move. Um, then one day, I saw Bill Kazmaier on TV, and I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. And that's what, that's what turned me on. So tell me about you and Ernie. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I could say enough nice things about Ernie. Not one bad thing could ever come out of my mouth. Uh, he's always been a great guy and always been there for every lifter I can ever imagine. I mean, Ernie will, Ernie will try to help everyone. And I started going there uh, on the advice, I think, Francis Rudiger. Because I used to go to Rudy's garage and lift when it was just like a two and a half car garage. And he recommended I go out there sometimes and meet them out there. And I'd go out there on Saturday and do my whole dead lift routine and all my assistance exercises and Ernie and Bill Sino and Dennis Reed and Cal Sachs and all these other guys to be out there doing you know squat bench and deadlift all in one day and I was like no that's not what I want to do I would just do this and uh, they helped me out all the guys helped me out so how far along in your career were you when you, when you met Ernie I was a 165er in fact, when you know my first nationals, I went to in uh, 1983 in Austin, Texas, and I think uh, we met up with Larry Pacifico in the lobby, and I was still 19 years old, and he had John Tops the glue there, who was one of his big lifters, who had already done some some really good things, and uh, he said, "Well, Ernie, who do you got lifting?" He goes, uh, "Well, I got this kid that's going to total like you know, well over 18, 18 and a half or so." And uh, at 165, he goes, who's that? And Ernie pointed to me, this little pale, skinny little white kid. And Larry just kind of laughed. And at the meet, you know, I, I missed weight by one pound. I did almost everything I could think of to get the weight off, and it wouldn't come off. I, my ass was like Rich Gasperi. It was just shredded. And uh, I weighed in later on for the 181s, and I went 9 for 9. And I did a, a 699 squat, a 429 bench, and that was before shirts and a 727 deadlift, and I, I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, Dick Zenzen was there, and Dick said, hey, let me help you for the day, and he helped me for the day, and I went nine for nine. I was still 19 years old. So when you go from a weight class to weight class, are you were you one of those guys that's like, let me, let me eat my way up to a weight class, or you just let it naturally I had happen? to move up. Yeah, I was already in that weight class and would in the upper weight class and would diet down, so I had to go up. And when my body just said you you have to gain weight and go up, you know, let's go up, and it just was there right away. So you're just packing on the muscle, basically. Yeah, it was it was already ready to be there. So have you had had like a strategy nutrition wise, or are you more of a purist than Not just like before? Back, back before, I mean, I could get away with it. I was, I was young and growing. I, I could eat, eat freaking frosted flakes if I wanted to, and and still grow. It was just, you know, it was just, it was gonna be because the stress. I was young. I could handle a lot of stress, and I was ready to grow. Um, nowadays, of course, it's a little different. I mean, I, but no one knew it back then either. No one knew what they do now, anyways. So uh, yeah, I, I watch myself a little more now. So what do you think about uh, supplements, you know, protein powders, da-da-da? Did you ever do that jazz, or were you I, just... I never really did it that much, but I should have, because I never had that big of an appetite. If I would have had a couple protein shakes and stuff like that, uh, I probably would have been bigger. I don't know about better, but definitely bigger. So, you know, they, they, I, my my you know views on protein supplements is 
or all the other supplements is they act as an insurance policy to make sure you get what you're supposed to because how many people can eat five times a day perfect and get what they're supposed to it's really really hard especially if you work or or what your stress load is so yeah i definitely recommend them So tell me about the whole the whole IPF controversy. What was from beginning Nothing. to I got, end? I got I got caught on a drug test, and uh, one of the ones I was guilty because they came out with a uh, a new drug test for Deca at the time, and uh, all the Americans went to the worlds and weren't told about the new test, but all the Europeans knew. Even Mike Lambert said that in his magazine, so I'm, I'm not exaggerating. But you know, I was I was guilty and took my lump, and the second time I. Uh, I came up high for something called Xeranol, which I didn't even know what the hell it was. I was like, no, I never took anything like that. But they said my TE level was a little bit high, but that was the main thing is they said something something like that, some veterinary thing that I never heard of for cattle feed or something. Yeah, it's like, what the hell? So how that happened, I don't know, but uh, um, I took my lumps, you know? Okay, I took my lumps. I wasn't a saint. And the third time, which, you know, makes me look even worse, is they said my... T levels were high, and then they tested, retested my A sample again. You guys got all your stuff. At first, they said it was just barely in a gray area. Then they tested it again and said it was way high. Then they tested my B sample, which you're not supposed to test the A sample twice. And I even sent an expert, a Dr. Rod Bilton from England, who actually had a case against the IAF and won for a, uh, a girl named Diane Modell in track and field, which is why they moved the IAF out of England to like Monaco or Morocco or some place like that where they couldn't be touched. And uh, he said, no, there's people's names that were on the first test that are on the second test and stuff that should have been, you know, anonymity and all this stuff. And it was just a big clusterfuck. And, and I know I wasn't guilty, but I bring a lawyer with me who heard everything. And it was weird because at the time the USPF was the USAPL guys were trying to get into the US or the IPF because the World Federation they had wasn't really good for shit at the time. And when the when the voting came up, the USPF lost a bid to get to stay in the IPF by the same exact vote as the vote for me to have my stuff overturned or to have me retested a whole bunch of times for a whole year. That was kind of a little fishy. But uh, whatever. You know, you live and you learn and you get better and that's it. I, I came out ahead in the long run as far as I lifted the way I wanted to lift, under conditions I wanted to lift and had a good time and have a lot of friends in the sport. Um, whether it's whether it's uh, IPF friends, whether it be USAPL or USPF guys that have stuck by me the whole time or here in the APF or SPF or wherever the hell it is, um, I pretty much get along with everyone. So speaking about that, speaking about the different federations, what's your what's your take on that? Uh, the, the, you know, well, I, I, obviously, it's drug testing is different than not drug testing. Obviously, single ply is different than multiply or walking out of squat. Um, the what should be constant that's not is the judging. You know, if the judging says whether it be multiply or single ply or raw, whatever, is if you have to break parallel, break parallel, and there's too much bullshit out there, just just do it, and it's. The rest will take care of itself because all the lifters get along. I've never seen a problem amongst lifters. Maybe some little pussies on the internet with, with fake names. That's about it. But uh, lifters are, everyone loves everyone. Whether, like I said, whether it be, you know, I IPF or USAPL or APF or USPF or whoever, everyone gets along. The lifters get along. This is a bunch of crap. So looking at the beginning of powerlifting mm -hmm. and looking at it where, it's na where it is now. Are we on even footing of, of, let's say, you back in the time of, let's say, like the 85 Hawaiian meet? Or is it, uh, is it a better sport? Is it uh, a more popular sport? Where, where do you all think the, we are in the all timeline? Depends what federation you're on. If you're, if you're USAPL, you're saying, oh, no, because those guys are they're ruining it for everyone. The multiply guys, they're doing this. 
and then the multiply guys are well the IPF guys are too strict and that's a bunch of crap where you have to go that low and you go do this so it all depends where you're at me I'm, I'm kind of in the middle I got friends that are, you know in both places it's it's if, 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 if you're multiplying that's the way you want to do it's going in a great direction because it's growing and it's getting better for you guys if it's in the IPF it's going better in that direction so it's just two polarized views so I've got all the magic powers in the world mm -hmm. And I make you the king of all powerlifting decisions. What do you do with the federations? Not much. Not much. It's, it's you know, uh, the lifters have to be happy, but the, the lifters also need a warden. <laughs> Basically, you can't let the inmates run the asylum. So the, the rules just have to be stuck to. Like I said, you know, if, if, if guys want to use a monolift, they want to use multiply suits, that's fine. They just got to squat low, because that seems to be the most problem in, the, in that federation, in that kind of lifting. In the IPF, I've seen guys squat well below parallel and get screwed. Where it's, you know, you put on a blue blazer and all of a sudden you got the power to, to ruin people that train their ass off and traveled all over the world. And that shouldn't be the case. You should at least be a lifter because there's, there's people that are judges that were never lifters. And, you know, a, a questionable call, man, right away, and I, everyone says, I'm a prick and I'm strict. Well, a questionable call goes to the lifter, not a red light. So that, that, that's a little bit of a difference. So in essence, what you're saying is, if the judges can be consistent and go with the rule book, we're yeah. in pretty good shape. Yes, It's a exactly. pretty, pretty amazing yes, sport. Sure. Why not let anyone do whatever they want to? It's a free country. Who cares? So I mentioned earlier the, the 1985 record breakers meet. Mm -hmm. Give me your memories of that thing. Oh, wow. I was still a kid. I was I was 21. I went there with Ernie and all the boys because you could see I wore my front shirt on there. And uh, I weighed in. A, I was a real light 198er. And that's kind of you know I I did some good lifts before that at 181, but that's where when I gained that extra you know 18 pounds or whatever, that's where I started. The, the, my leverages came into play. And uh, I mean I was around the big boys. I mean Ernie Cash, Doug Furnish, God rest his soul. He passed away last year in March. Um, Ted Arcidi, he was my roommate, which is quite funny. Big Gus, I mean, Gus is the king there. Uh, Tony Saunders, there was John Topsigu, there was uh, Jeff Magruder, there's these monsters there that was, it was, it was pretty damn cool. So uh, I just stayed close to Ernie, you know, the whole time, and uh, I didn't know not to be nervous, so I just lifted and had fun, and it was fun. I made everything I wanted to. It was fun. He Gus set up a nice meet uh, for the lifters where you didn't feel stress, and that was the big thing. You, want, I didn't want to have to go to some of these meets that I used to and worry about the judges more than I did my own lifting. I know I squat below parallel all the time. I never had a problem with that. But going to some meets, you'd worry about that. Why do I got to worry about the judges? You don't want to have to worry about that. You want a stress-free meet. I know I got to do this, and that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm okay with it. And I had fun. It was, I mean, and then, you know, at just the stories and hanging around these guys was just hilarious. Oh, my gosh. I don't think I could tell some of the stories. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. So you've mentioned a 165 class. You've yeah. mentioned a 181, 198. Now, everybody knows about your 220 class because mm -hmm. that's where you pulled 901. Yeah. What weight class were you the best at and why? 198 and 220. 198 up to a point and then I had to get, let, let the weight go up to protect myself. And uh, 220 because I was still healthy enough. I mean, I think I had torn a peck before, but it wasn't that bad. And uh, I was still healthy enough and just strong as shit. Where I, I was like Superman. There's nothing I could touch I, 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 that I'd miss. I mean, in the gym before that meet, I doubled 900 really, really easy for a dead stop double. double. And, t and under today's standard, it was raw, you know, just a belt. Um, the Z suit, I always wore my Z suits as long as I could. Even, you know, with, uh, I'd have, in, I'd send them back to Inzer and have him uh, stitch them up a little bit if there was runs in them and stuff. And the old, the old blast shirt was nothing. I, I barely got anything out of that. And, uh, uh, but that's the way it was, and you had to do it. So, and like I said, you know. I, the, the problems I see with guys today is they don't lay down a new base every time to get bigger, faster, stronger every single time. And uh, I think that would help out a lot of guys more. So you mean for every meet, 
yeah, I went back and did my reps, did the, did worked on my weak points every single time. Did you ever bomb out of a meet? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, besides the, the leg blowout, the other, only other time was Jerry Jones ran the, the Nationals in Minnesota, the APF Nationals in Minnesota one year. And uh, what he didn't tell us is he was supposed to have some new weights bro uh, that came in, and he didn't get them. So he went to the, the, the Road Warriors gym, uh, Animal and Hawk, and he got their 100-pound plates. Well, my squats were okay, my benches were just okay, and I thought I was stronger than that. Came down to the deadlift, opened up at like 850, should have been like nothing. I bombed out, I missed them all. And what I found out from Animal afterwards is some of those hundreds were 108, some were 106, some were 104, and I had four on each side, so that was a hell of a misload, but Jerry never told any of us. Then later on when the heavyweights lifted, he added weight on for the heavyweights to whatever their, you know, whatever their openers were and stuff like that. So he let them know, but we didn't know. Guess who won my class? Jerry Jones. <laughs> <laughs> the old prick, God rest his soul, dude. So tell us about the 901 deadlift. It was like nothing. I mean, like I said, I, I doubled 900 before the meet. And, uh, and it, w it was a full meet, two hour weigh-in in the USPF. And at that meet, they did drug tests for everything but testosterone, because the testosterone test was just being refined a little bit better. So uh, if you want to take testosterone, that's all you could take. You couldn't take anything else. So uh, uh, I squatted 959, which weighed out to 962. I benched uh, 545, which was raw. There was no bench shirts in that meet allowed. And uh, I opened up at, uh, I believe it was 837 in the deadlift. And if you ever watched that opener, it was like 135. I didn't even know it was there. It was just my day. And uh, I called for 898. Because in our, and you know Doug was coaching me in my, in our mind and his buddy Gary Burns, and in my our mind it was all oh, you're a powerlifter first. Let's get 2400. So we put 898 on the bar for for 2402, and it turned out that the weights were were heavy. So 898 weighed out to 901, and I tried 920, which was like 923 or four, and uh, it was just anticlimactic. So I, I pulled it up over my knees, and I was just a little bit forward, but. Uh, I should have had it. I just didn't. So when you when you look at lifters today, I mean, nine hundred one is kind of the number that just nobody can really seem to touch. Yeah. Why so is, far. Why is that? Um. There's someone out there. They'll find them. You know. I just hope, like you know, like they just had a meet in Russia, where they, where they broke some old records of mine. But you know, they were, you know, Baylev did a, I think an eight sixty one at one ninety eight deadlift. And the, the other guy, I don't want to say his name because I, I, I would butcher it. I don't want to disrespect his family. Um, um, he pulled like a 893 or 4 deadlift or 892 deadlift. and uh, But they did it in single meet. I did my stuff in a, in a full meet. So it's a little bit different, like with two-hour weigh-ins and stuff like that. But nonetheless, those were good lifts. But there's someone out there that will eventually do it. And, you know, as long as it's legit, what do I care? Good job. I had my day. I did my stuff. I was happy with the way I did it. Could I have done more? Yeah, probably, but I didn't. And, you know, that's just the fact. That's it. I think when everybody sees that uh, their their favorite band from the 70s or 80s, they're like, God, why can't they just why can't they just pull themselves quit. together yeah. and this like, old boxer? Why didn't Evander, Evander Holyfield quit earlier? No, 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 no. Why don't why doesn't Guns N' Roses just get together and play again? Yeah. Why couldn't they put David Lee Roth back in Van Halen, which mm -hmm. they did? So I think I think what people want to know is, you don't have to go gung ho and go knee wraps and da da da, but. Why not get yourself in shape, and uh, if for nothing else, but just to set some raw records at 50? Just why, to be happy. Why not just to it, go you, for it? it, it you got to be satisfied and, and make yourself happy. And as uh, power lifters, even when you don't compete, you still got to run these little mini cycles and stuff to have a goal every time. You can't just go in the gym and work out. As I think, as Dave Tate said, you know, there's a difference between working out and training. And I train, and that's what I want to do. I, I can't just go in the gym and play around and be pretty. I can't do that. I got to have a goal in mind. So no, no, you're not looking at any kind of competition? I'm not looking at it until 
I get up to a point where I say, hey, you know what, I'm strong enough, I should think about this. Let me see how it goes. You know, I mean, is that kicking around in the back of your head a little bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Always kicks around back there, which, yeah. whether or not it gets kicked out. Because I think if I, if I could speak for everyone watching this, they're saying, let it out. Let Johnny let out of the out. bag. Go for well, it. Well, I have to be satisfied with the numbers first. So if I get my numbers back up again, then I, yeah, then I would for fun. And it would, it would be fun. So for argument's sake, like an 8, 450, and a... Seven, or a little more than 450, probably, and probably closer to an eight deadlift again. Then. Okay, yeah. okay. So, one of my questions is let's say you hadn't had that injury, mm -hmm. okay? Which one? The misload. <laughs> well, first of all, how much was the misload? The misload in floor or in uh, Vegas, uh, I think I opened up at like. 942 or 947 and they loaded on 1036 and I almost had it <laughs> I almost had it so let's say let's say you didn't have the injury how much stronger do you think you would have gotten or do you think you had already reached well, the, 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 in, the this the knee injury was caused at the Mountaineer Cup the actual misload the big misload was caused was a, a meeting uh, like a USPF meeting in uh, Las Vegas. Um, I did hurt hurt the leg a little bit on the misload, but in, in in the Mountaineer Cup, what I did is I, I offset my stance a little bit too much because I was in a hurry, like an idiot. I never do it, and I set my right leg out too far. So when I came down, the right leg buckled in, and it I knew it was buckling in, and I couldn't stop it. And then I just felt this big snap, like your leg snapped in half. And I, I tore my patellar tendon in half. So you had that injury, so are you thinking, I'm done with powerlifting? What were you thinking? <coughs> Excuse me, no, I didn't think that at all. I think, you know, uh, I can't wait to get back. And, you know, my, my cousin is an orthopedic surgeon. He fixed me. And uh, he basically told my therapist, um, who worked for him, uh, you know how to get Eddie better, Eddie knows how to get strong, I know what I did on the inside, you two guys don't screw up. And that was all he said. And uh, within six months I was back squatting again with no problem and no pain or anything. I've never had a problem with me ever again. So tell me, tell me about the hip, what caused the hip issue then? Uh, from the doctors uh, over in Norway, that's where I had it done. They pretty much said that uh, it looked like my right leg was just a couple millimeters shorter than my left. And I, I've always had a flat foot on the right side, so it probably made me set, point my toe a little bit different. He said, just put more stress on there for a longer period of time. That's it. So just over time, basically. Yeah, so it's just not like powerlifting caused it. It was more like a, you know, a, a defect in, in the size of my legs, you know, the length of my legs that did it. Which, so, you know, normal people have that but they don't put all the weight on their back for 28 years like that. Right. So, just in general, I mean, what makes you different than everybody else? What, like, how come other guys with the work ethic and other guys that you don't have the right build. How come not everybody does what you've done? Like, what makes you different? I don't know. Maybe it's something I got on the inside. Maybe it's you know, heart, mind. Maybe some little different connections on the inside with tendons and stuff like that. I don't know. But from the very beginning when I started, I just kept on moving up and I never stopped. And all I wanted to do was get better. I didn't worry about anyone else's number. I just worried about what I knew I could do. And I stuck to that routine and made that routine part of me but was realistic every single cycle I did. I set a, a new base every cycle, then went to the meet. Set a new base every cycle, then went to the meet. So I got that base stronger and stronger and stronger each time out, which I think is what benefited me. When you first, let's go back to like your first five years powerlifting. Mm -hmm. How often would you compete? Um, at first it was like a, uh, three times a year or so like that. Then when I started do, getting, winning like the, the nationals and stuff, it was just nationals and worlds, nationals and worlds, that was it. It really wasn't enough time for me because I like doing long cycles and I like building that base every off season where I didn't, I didn't have the time to do that.
So, so you could go back in time. You get a little Michael Jai, uh, Michael J. Fox, uh, yeah, little car. Yeah. Um, anything you change? Uh, just like I wouldn't have blew out my pack. I wouldn't have torn my bicep. I wouldn't have tore a chunk of tricep. I wouldn't have blew out my knee. Probably wouldn't have had a have a new hip so early. Uh, that's about it. There's not a lot of else. Every, you know, all, all the friends I got that I met over the years. Um, you can't buy that. If I went back in time, it probably would be different. I don't want it to be different. Anything that you left off the plate, like, oh, you know, I really wanted to have this bench, or I really wanted to have this particular Oh, yeah, bench. I could have deadlifted more. I probably could have squatted a little more. Um, if I would have practiced with one of the new bench shirts for a while, I probably would have benched well over six, no problem, because, I mean, uh, my best bench in the gym, raw, I did a 565 pause. So nowadays, that would be like seven-something. <laughs> but... Uh, I didn't, so it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm happy with the way I did it. There's nothing I could change. I mean, there's lifts I could have got that I think I could have got. I, I wish I would have videotaped some of my stuff in the gym, some of my raw stuff and some of my other stuff. I think that would be pretty cool for some people to see. But that's it. I wouldn't change any, anything else. So somebody says to you, where do you see your place in powerlifting history? And this is a question where it's okay to talk about yourself because I know you're a really modest oh, guy. I, never, I can't talk about myself. But um, like, I, I like when people say how good I was, and I know I was good. I know I'm among the greats. Um, that's up for other people to decide who is the greatest based on who you like. Um, but I was really, really happy with the way I did things and how I did them and my relationships with people from every every nation and every federation i'm really happy with that and and i and and, and I, I always have done my best to help out everyone i can so being a a nice guy a, a nice regular guy that lifted a hell of a lot of weight that's pretty cool well we're going to call this part one okay because every time we meet i'm going to add right. on to that's the next cool. part of the next part yeah but i want to say that uh I mean, I can't remember the first time I met you. I, you know, I tell the guys at uh, Monster Garage Gym. I think I met you when you were, weren't you the principal or something here? Yeah. I think that that's might when, have been the, yeah, one that's, of the first times I met yeah, you. Yeah, that was in, oh gosh, like the mid-90s or something. That went fast. Yeah, that went real, real fast. But uh, it's like that story I just wrote about Ernie. Like, I re that's the first time you remember meeting me. Mm -hmm. The first time I remember meeting you uh, we were at Quad's gym, and what I told the guys at the gym was, you don't really train with Ed, you train at the same time as Ed. <laughs> so I was training at the same time, but of course, mm -hmm. nobody's going to notice a 650 puller when the guy's pulling like, you know. You well, see, back then, if, if I saw someone pull 650 easy, I was like, oh shit, man, I got to step it up. Didn't matter if I was pulling 800 or whatever, I got to step it up. I don't want anyone that close. I didn't like it at all. Well, I remember that day, because to me, it was phenomenal just being there, and I tried to avoid eye contact with you, because you were kind of in this very special place in your When I trained, thing. I yeah. was like in the zone, it would be, hey, I'd, mm, yeah. ugh, it no, was, that was about it. Yeah, it was 880 that day. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It was pretty good, it was very impressive. But uh, yeah, that's the first time that I met you, because I remember it, because mm -hmm. you were definitely getting ready for a meet, and it was a fantastic thing. But anyway, what I want to say is that, you know, every time we talk, you're always very you just are great with your time, and I think you're a great ambassador Thanks. for the sport. It. And um, I'm looking forward to part two and three. Yeah, and four it should and be five. fun. I enjoy it. Brings back a lot of great memories for me. A lot of great people, uh, hopefully, through this won't be forgotten. Take care.